hard. And I'm in the bad habit of not using PowerPoint presentations. Although I prepared one on a request from the organizers, but you may excuse me for not looking at the slides. Well, uh, the focus of this workshop is on the quantification of uncertainty and on sensitivity and analysis of complex models. I will be talking uh, in a very non-mathematical language about uncertainty as such. And that requires to be quantified. Uh, the term uncertainty, once you pronounce the word uncertainty, implies that this term uh, does not admit of uh, an unambiguous definition. Let's not attempt a definition of uncertainty. Let's try to understand uncertainty in a way that uh, helps us to go ahead. And that way, I would say the best way to understand uncertainty uh, is to take it as a situation in which uh, we fail to have a unique objective understanding of the underlying phenomenon or system or process. So the absence of a unique objective understanding or comprehension of the underlying phenomenon being studied in any research work can be branded as uncertainty. Uncertainty arises out of several factors. And that way, taking uncertainty along with those contributory factors, we find that uh, most decisions that we take are characterized by four features, uncertainty, complexity, ambiguity, and ignorance. In fact, some people argue, and not without reasons, that uh, uncertainty is the consequence. The contributory factors are three in number, complexity of the underlying phenomenon being studied, and subsequently of the model that is used to represent that phenomenon, ambiguity about certain features or properties or even terms and phrases, and lastly, our ignorance about the physics of the phenomenon. So these three contributory factors, I repeat, complexity of the phenomenon being studied, ambiguity about uh, certain features or properties possessed by the underlying system, and uh, multiple connotations of the same words and phrases, followed by ignorance of all of us, including the topmost scientists and technologists about phenomena being studied. These three lead to uncertainty. Accordingly, I will talk about different forms of uncertainty. But before that, let us note that uh, all decisions that we take, and even the way that we would like to implement any of the selected decisions, abounds in uncertainty. Uncertainty arising out of either complexity, or ambiguity, or ignorance. Coming to talk about uncertainty, the earliest form of uncertainty is branded as aleatory uncertainty. Aleatory uncertainty was, uh, in fact, involved in the early development of the theory of probability in the 15th, 16th centuries. And uh, aleatory uncertainty is essentially a consequence of complexity and ignorance. The phenomenon being studied or the system under investigation was quite complex, affected by a large number of factors of which some are beyond our knowledge. We are ignorant of those. And that ignorance and the complexity of the underlying system, they beget what we call aleatory uncertainty. Aleatory uncertainty for students of mathematics and statistics must be noted as the uh, earliest form of uncertainty recognized in probability theory, accordingly quantified by probability theory as well. In fact, those were the days when uh, people started talking about maritime insurance. Uh, uh, 
merchants in uh, some of the coastal European countries used to uh, definitely carry merchandise overseas. And uh, there are risks of uh, either damage or complete loss of the merchandise during transit. Therefore, well, against this risk, the people who had to send their merchandise abroad, they had to pay some premium to get their property or their merchandise insured. That was the beginning of maritime insurance. And uh, aleatory uncertainty was also taken account of in the maritime insurance practice. <coughs> this aleatory uncertainty, I repeat, which was the earliest form of uncertainty that was quantified in terms of probability that was made use of in maritime insurance exercises was uh, essentially due to our ignorance and uh, the complexity of the phenomenon. In fact, whenever a particular phenomenon or system or process was being affected by a whole host of factors and uh, we were ignorant about some of these factors, we wanted to brand these factors which could not be separately isolated and therefore could not be controlled by us as chance factors. We would call them as chance factors as distinct from assignable factors about which we were knowledgeable, which we could isolate and most of which we could control. And that way the chance factors, they led to the phenomenon being branded as a, a chance phenomenon or as a random phenomenon. Randomness was taken as a consequence of the operation of certain chance factors over and above assignable factors affecting the underlying phenomenon. But then you all have heard the name of T.H. Huxley, that great physicist belonging to the family of Nobel laureates, Huxley's. T.H. Huxley once made a remark which I can never forget in my life. He told chances and accidents are aliases of ignorance. So what somebody calls a chance factor is really a factor about which you are ignorant. Chance and accident, these two words are aliases or other names, pseudonyms of ignorance. Since you are ignorant of these factors, you call them chance factors. Since you are ignorant, you cannot isolate them, you cannot brand them individually, therefore you call them chance factors. And this ignorance is the root cause of aleatory uncertainty. So that way, Huxley's statement is quite, uh, quite important in the sense that uh, basically ignorance leads to uncertainty. Maybe the phenomenon was not that very complex in some cases, like the shipment of merchandise across seas. There could be a very simple phenomenon, like tossing a coin on the surface of a table, and the outcomes being heads or tails, which you cannot exactly predict. You call the phenomenon of coin tossing a chance or a random phenomenon because you are ignorant about certain factors which affect the outcome of a coin tossing experiment. Physicists could identify four factors which control the outcome of a coin tossing experiment. These four were angle of throw, velocity of throw, velocity of wind blowing and surface roughness. Now since you are repeatedly throwing the coin on the same surface, surface roughness is not varying, cannot cause variations in the outcome, so ruled out. This is a humidified or, I mean, an air conditioned room, no velocity of air blowing, ruled out. You are left with only two assignable factors, the velocity of throw and the angle of throw. Okay, use a uh, throwing machine, control both angle of throw and velocity of throw. Even then you get heads and tails. So you admit that there are some factors beyond these four which are known to you, which are assignable, which also contribute to variations in the outcome. And therefore, this is a chance phenomenon. And Huxley tells you, you call them chance because you are ignorant of those other factors. You are knowledgeable about these four, there are many other factors. This is aleatory uncertainty. Then comes what is typically called model uncertainty. In the sense that uh, in any scientific inquiry, we try to represent the underlying phenomenon by a model. 
a model is a set of postulates or a set of uh, data specific assumptions or um, uh, it could be in terms of certain assumptions about the behavior of the data that you already collected and that way you start with a model and you are not sure, you are not certain that the model that you are proposing to represent the relevant features of the phenomenon you are going to study, that model is either appropriate or adequate, even if appropriate. You could use an appropriate model but may fail to represent adequately all the relevant features of that particular phenomenon that you want to investigate into. Or, I mean, the model that you have chosen is at all not appropriate, it's inappropriate as a model. Therefore, there's a lot of model uncertainty. Uncertainty about the appropriateness and adequacy of the model that you have chosen to represent the underlying phenomenon. Now, quite often the model involves certain parameters as you know, if the model is a, I mean, a descriptive model like a probability model or a stochastic process model or even an optimization model, there will be some parameters involved and there will be some uncertainty about those parameters in many cases. So as a component of model uncertainty comes in parameter uncertainty. You are not sure about the parameter involved. Uh, you take some values for the time being since you are not quite knowledgeable about the other values of the parameter which could have better been taken into account. Therefore, parameter uncertainty comes in. Some of you might be aware of a very famous experiment uh, which won a Nobel Prize. The Nobel Prize was won in 1927, but the experiment was conducted in 1909, typically called the Millikan experiment. Uh, an experiment conducted by two great physicists, Millikan and Fletcher. Uh, this was an experiment called the oil droplet experiment. Electrically charged oil was there fine droplets were allowed and through that this experiment resulted in the evaluation of a fundamental physical constant called small e. Small e is called the elementary charge, elementary electrical charge. 1909 was a year by which time subatomic particles had not been identified. So it was the elementary charge carried by an atom and that's e is uh, 10 to the power minus 19 into a small factor of coulombs. Coulomb is the unit for electrical charge. And this was found out by Millikan. This is still typically called the Millikan experiment. Subsequently, people found that Millikan's result in terms of that multiplier of 10 to the power minus 19 coulombs was not correct. This is because Millikan assumed a wrong value for viscosity of air. Some of you might be somewhat surprised to note the term viscosity of air. Air is a mixture of gases and all fluids, fluids are both liquids as also gases, have viscosity and Millikan assumed a wrong figure for viscosity of air. That led to a wrong figure of small e, which has been subsequently corrected. So that way the parameter, namely viscosity of air, was not certainly known to Millikan, he took a wrong value and that introduced another uncertainty into the result. So that was parameter uncertainty. Uh, in many cases, uh, we are sure about the pattern of variation, but not so sure about the parameters involved. So that's a parameter uncertainty as basically a component of model uncertainty is quite often an important form of uncertainty that requires to be quantified and that requires to be guarded against. Well, apart from parameter uncertainty, there is parameter variation across occasions. Sometimes a parameter that doesn't cause an uncertainty in the sense that Millikan had taken the wrong figure for viscosity of air can also vary from occasion to occasion. And this variation in a parameter or parametric variation across occasions is also a source of model uncertainty. So both parametric uncertainty and uh, parametric variation across occasions, they also contribute to model uncertainty. In fact, parametric uncertainty need not be recognized 
as a third source of uncertainty, it's rather inside model uncertainty. And model uncertainty is a very important uh, issue of uh, concern for discussion by scientists today. After you have assumed a model and you are not certain about its appropriateness or adequacy, you go to conduct an experiment to collect data. Now comes experimental uncertainty. So the, in a way, the third form of uncertainty, the first being aleatory, the second being model, the third is experimental uncertainty, which uh, sometimes uh, experimental scientists do not take very seriously. In the sense that very well-known scientists, including uh, not simply Millikan and Fletcher, but many other former Nobel laureates, used to take results of experiments, find some which are typically in our language to the outliers, but would keep a record, as Millikan did, as bad results and good results. And the principal Millikan uh, had himself recorded in his diary was that uh, good results in bad results out. So that was something arbitrary, where an experiment repeated over time, giving rise to several results, was sorted out by the experimenter as uh, some being bad, some being good, without test for outliers and all that. Outliers should be rejected, not that way. They would say, these are bad results, those are out. These are good results, they should be in. And this uh, noting by Millikan in his own diary led to the identification of the fact that uh, his value of E was smaller than the current value of E because of the wrong assumption about the viscosity of air. Experimental uncertainty, which is associated with the way the experiment is conducted and the results are recorded. Uh, we had two very distinguished faculty members of ISAR who got uh, Shanti Sharu Bhatnagar Award for their contributions in chemistry. I had once talked to some faculty members of my university in Calcutta about this uh, measurement uncertainty. I myself uh, worked a lot on measurement uncertainty on behalf of the Department of Science and Technology Government of India. And there is a committee in the National Physical Laboratory headed by me to go into measurement uncertainty. We, of course, as statisticians, do not care about the quality of measurements. We take the measurements as such, go ahead to fit a model, to interpret, and then ultimately come to certain conclusions. But then the measurements with which we start should be very carefully examined about their inherent quality, in the sense that uh, the measurements, uh, they may not be really uh, having two important properties namely precision and accuracy. These two terms are taken synonymously by most laymen, but uh, we being scientific uh, personnel should make a distinction between the terms precision on the one hand and accuracy on the other. Accuracy of a measurement is the closeness of the measurement that you got with the true value of the property, whereas precision is in terms of consistency among repeat measurements. So sometimes in physics or chemistry laboratories, we were conducting an experiment, repeating the results several times. If the repeat measurements were close to one another, showing enough of consistency, they showed precision. On the other hand, if they were precise in the sense that repeat measurements are very close to one another, but all the measurements, because of a wrong instrument, were far away from the true value, they were all inaccurate. So it's somewhat surprising, but true scientifically, that your measurements could be precise, but could be inaccurate. You want both accuracy and precision. That's why the earlier concepts of uncertainty, I'm sorry, of imprecision and inaccuracy have been discarded in favor of the more recent concept of uncertainty. And there's a manual called the Indian Standard Manual for Estimating Uncertainty in Measurements 
published by NABL. Some of you might be knowing NABL is National Accreditation Board for Laboratories. NABL has got a publication, NABL 141, for estimating uncertainty in measurements. Uncertainty in measurements is experimental uncertainty. Uncertainty in measurements uh, is somewhat linked up with the theory of errors in the inverse way. In the sense that uh, more than 300 years back, people in physics and astronomy, they knew that um, if I start with the same true value, in other words, if I start with the same property of the same entity and then take repeat measurements, the repeat measurements, even if carefully taken, would show some variations, which you could represent by a distribution. So that way you could get a probability distribution of uh, observed measurements, which all corresponded to a single true value. Now extend this logic a little further, logically, in the sense that I try to just show it in terms of my hands. Suppose this is a one particular physical entity. You are measuring one particular property. It has a true value. You may not know it, it doesn't matter. The true value is pretty often unknown. Uh, we have metrology as the science of good measurements. And metrology starts with two, two propositions which counters one to the other. The first proposition is every measurement, which is a property to be measured, has a true value. And the second proposition is the true value is indeterminate. You can never determine it, except in theory. That the boiling point of water is 100 degrees centigrade is a theoretical result. Forget about theory. No property of any concrete entity which you want to measure, the true value can be determined by you. It can't be determined. So these are two uh, very interesting propositions in metrology, namely that every measurement has a true value, and the true value is indeterminate. So what do we do? We get uh, some repeat measurements and take the average. Sometimes you identify some outliers, just uh, reject them, take the other values, take the average. The average could be even a median, doesn't matter. You may not take the mean. But then, the point is that uh, if I take one entity which has a true value and then get repeat measurements, I get a distribution of the measured values. I get another entity with a slightly different true value. If I take measurements of that particular property, I will get another distribution. I take a third entity with the same property, a third true value, I get a distribution of observed values. So if I take several entities, concrete objects, with the same property, differing by very small quantities, and then take repeat measurements on each one of them, what I will get? I will get a number of overlapping distributions. I will get a number of overlapping distributions. And then I come back to the question. I give you a single measurement. Tell me from which distribution did it come? It's the converse question. The theory of errors was concerned with a single true value and a distribution of measured values. I've got several true values quite close to one another. Therefore, observed values, if I could repeat experiments on them, would give rise to overlapping distributions. I've got a single observed value. You tell me which is the true value. That's a very difficult question to answer. And this is the question of uncertainty. You are uncertain about the true value. You are given an observed value. In the laboratory, you get a particular measurement. Or you may repeat and get the arithmetic mean of several measurements. You remain uncertain about the true value. Because this value can come from this distribution, can come from this distribution, can also come from this distribution. Each distribution corresponds to a distribution of observed values against a true value. Which was the true value in your case? A very difficult question. And uh, this is a question that is sometimes faced by people in uh, biostatistics. Uh, some of you might be aware of bioassays. Raise hands, please. At least one. Uh, there are two forms of bioassays. A bioassay is a biological experiment 
where the composition or the effectiveness usually called potency of uh, an unknown biological preparation is uh, measured against the effectiveness or the composition of a standard biological preparation. That's called bioassay. Uh, you are given one figure from the test preparation that you are going to check and one figure from the standard preparation. You have to take the ratio as a measure of what is called relative potency of the test preparation against the standard. Now given one value only, this is not a question of the one value differing from the mean value. There is no concept of a mean value. Remember, we talk of a distribution of values around their mean. It is not that probability distribution. I'm not talking of the mean value. It's a single true value. And there are observed values. Whereas we in general, in probability theory or statistics, talk about variation of individual values about the mean value or about some measure of central tendency. This is a different question altogether. I've got a single true value and several observed values for that single true value. I get a distribution. And I have to um, get the ratio to get an idea about relative potency in bioassays. Forget about bioassays. This is a particular type of inference, which is typically called, not so much in vogue these days, fiducial inference. Fiducial inference uh, was later on criticized by Neyman a lot, and that way has not been accepted so much. But this is behind what is called fiducial inference. They talk of fiducial intervals instead of confidence intervals. You all know confidence intervals, or most of you know that. Instead of that, in fiducial inference, where I talk about distributions of observed values around a single true value, not distribution of individual values about a mean value or about a measure of central tendency, we talk of fiducial intervals. In terms of construction, they are alike. But conceptually, they are absolutely different. And I'm bringing in the concept of fiducial interval to some extent to deal with measurement uncertainty. So the point was, I've got one figure in the laboratory, physics or chemistry or biology, or several repeat measurements. I've taken the mean. I'm not certain about the true value. How do I get an idea about the uncertainty in measurements? Uh, this is the task, really speaking, what is called calibration. You have heard of the term calibration, but calibration is a very difficult scientific exercise which ultimately comes up with an idea about uncertainty in the measurement in terms of a correction factor to be applied to the observed value that you get. And even to get at this uh, correction factor, you require a whole, knowledge, whole lot of knowledge about a variety of probability distributions which are contained in that NABL 141 document. This is all experimental uncertainty. <coughs> so once you started with aleatory uncertainty because of ignorance and complexity, you come to model uncertainty because you wanted to have a model which may or may not be appropriate. Even if appropriate, may or may not be adequate. It would uh, involve certain parameters about whose values you are not certain as well. And uh, you come to model uncertainty, which includes uh, uncertainty about the appropriateness and adequacy of the model, uncertainty about parameters involved in the model, as also, as I said, <coughs> parametric variability. And once you talk about uh, parameter uncertainty and uh, parametric variability, uh, we talk about certain types of um, methods to reduce this uncertainty, not really to reduce this uncertainty, but to accommodate this uncertainty, or rather incorporate this uncertainty through what you call Bayesian methods and related other methods. You really don't try to reduce, but you try to incorporate this much of uncertainty. Because earlier, scientists were, in a way, ignoring uncertainty. They were simply somehow justifying the procedures they followed. The real 
change that has taken place is that now scientists with the help of stochastic uh, techniques and models have uh, understood the need to incorporate uncertainty, not to ignore it in terms of conclusions or inferences they would like to reach. And so from experimental uncertainty, which essentially deals with measurement uncertainty, we come to inferential uncertainty. We have to make some inferences based on the model and based on the data that you have collected through experiments. You might not have carried out the experiment yourselves, but the data that you are handling must have been carried out uh, in terms of an experiment done by some other scientist. And that comes to inferential uncertainty. Inferential uncertainty may be due to two sources. One would be in terms of evidential uncertainty. The other would be in terms of uncertainty in the processes that you use uh, to extract information out of the evidences. Evidential uncertainty would be in terms of, again, experimental uh, uncertainty or observational errors, in terms of misclassification of entities or objects. So various ways could lead to what may be called your <coughs> Evidential uncertainty. <clears throat> Essentially, all inferences are based on some premises. And the premises, as a very important part, particularly when you talk about statistical induction, would be in terms of the measurements or the observations of the data in general. By the way, incidentally for the students only, not for faculty members, uh, the word data, which is a Greek plural noun, would mean, uh, typically in English, whatever are given. The singular datum is whatever is given to you. To you means to the scientist, to the person making an inference. So whatever are given to me to make uh, an inference or to reach a conclusion should be called data. Whatever are given to me. Maybe that uh, some results of an experiment, some documents, some photographs, some signatures, right? Whatever are given to me should be called data. Data need not be all numerical data. Data need not be measurements, right? Data are whatever are given. So whatever are given to me to reach a conclusion about the underlying phenomenon or to make an inference about the underlying process or system will be in Greek data. And data constitute a very important component of premises. And premises are the, are the uh, basis for making an inference. In induction or deduction, in particular when you come to induction, where the inference is not guaranteed by the premises, we start with premises. In which we have the model, we have the data, we process the data with the help of the model. After processing, we reach the inference or the conclusion. So when you talk about any inference uh, situation, you start with premises, you process the premises, and you get the inference. You process the premises quite often through statistical techniques, also mathematical techniques. But some of the statistical techniques are such that they involve some unknown errors unknown errors, errors which are ascribed to ignorance, errors which are ascribed to chance factors, and therefore ignorance. And therefore, the way that you process the premises is usually referred to as a black box. This is the black box, not on the aircraft, but the black box through which the premises that you start with are processed to help you to reach the inference of the conclusion. It's black. Why? Because some of the techniques or the accessories or the, tech, the, the methods that you use to process the premises are involving ignorance. Therefore, the adjective black. If you, are, if you are completely knowledgeable about the way you process the 
the evidences or the premises to reach the inference, the box is not black. It's a black box because, I repeat, because the way you process the premises to extract information, to ultimately reach the conclusion, they themselves involve some errors. Errors are not errors in measurements. What you call errors, errors sum of squares. This is not sum of squares due to any error at all. This error is nothing but ignorance. This error is due to factors which are beyond your knowledge and beyond your control. In ANOVA, we talk of one component called the error sum of squares. This is not error of measurement at all. Nothing to do with errors in the usual sense of the term. This is error in the sense that this is due to ignorance. We have called them error. We do not know about them separately. We can't isolate them. We are ignorant about them. We can't control them. Therefore, we call it error. And because errors are involved in this processing, the box is black. So there are three components in all, the premises, the black box, and then the inference. Now, because the box is black, the inference is not certainly going to be true in all cases. It may or may not be true. That's why there will be some uncertainty about the inference. All statistical inferences, all inductive inferences that way, not merely statistical inductive inferences, all inductive inferences are associated with some amount of inferential uncertainty, which can be ascribed to evidential uncertainty. And if you are talking of statistical induction, also to the black box. The way you processed the premises, including the evidences that you collected, right? they involved some errors ascribable to ignorance. And therefore, there is some amount of uncertainty. There's a whole theory of uh, decision due to Dempster and Slipher. Uh, Dempster is well known to many of you in terms of the resampling theory contributions and all that. But then Dempster and Slipher uh, have given us a theory of decision which talks about uncertainty. And there, they say that there is a limit, there is an upper limit to the amount of information that evidences gathered by you can provide to you. Evidences cannot provide you all that is required to make the inference or the conclusion. There is a limit to the capability of evidences collected uh, to reach conclusions or to provide inferences. That's the summum bonum of uh, Dempster's refer theory. Uh, that's about uh, experimental uncertainty, inferential uncertainty, due partly to evidential uncertainty and partly due to to, as I said, uh, uncertainty associated with the way you extract information from the premises or the evidences. <coughs> with your kind permission, I'm taking a seat, right? So we started with aleatory uncertainty, primarily due to ignorance and uh, complexity of the phenomenon. We came to model uncertainty, because we are not sure about the appropriateness or the adequacy of the model that we used to represent the underlying phenomenon. That involved itself uh, parametric uncertainty, as well as uh, parametric variability across occasions. Uh, then we came to experimental uncertainty. And this experimental uncertainty is in a way linked up with evidential uncertainty, so far as inference making is concerned. And there will be also uncertainty in the black box, in the processing techniques through which you go from premises to the inference or the conclusion. <clears throat> Lastly, there is what is called epistemic. Epistemic. Uh, some of you might not be aware of the term epistemiology. Epistemology, not temiology. Epistemology uh, is what is called the, is the branch of philosophy that deals with the theory of knowledge. Theory of knowledge. How is knowledge acquired? How is knowledge verified? Etc. These are topics in epistemology or theory of knowledge. 
And uh, there is epistemic uncertainty, or what is called systemic uncertainty, primarily due to ambiguity, because the underlying system may be itself too complex. It may involve, as I said, certain features uh, which are latent. When you talk about variables in mathematics or in statistics, particularly in statistics or in stochastics, are slightly different from statistics, you will notice that some features of the underlying phenomenon are manifest. They are manifested in the sense that you can observe them, count them, or measure them. But there are some features which are not that manifest. They are called latent. And once we talk of latent variables or latent features, uh, latent variables or latent features, they are quite often ambiguous. They have multiple connotations. For example, um, some people, not you, of course, I know, may be interested in market research and may be interested uh, to know how much people or customers are satisfied with their products. <clears throat> the moot question is about satisfaction. Satisfaction is not manifest. Satisfaction is not manifest in terms of your appearance or in terms of what you say. What you say may not reveal your uh, inherent or latent a uh, feeling of satisfaction or dissatisfaction. Sometimes, even when we are dissatisfied, if somebody asks me a question, out of my modesty or humility, or even a sense of false or dignity, I will say, well, I am satisfied. Which means there is a big gap between your inner feeling of dissatisfaction and what you say in terms of manifest response, namely, I am satisfied. Now, latent features that way, even if somebody says, OK, I am satisfied. This OK, I am satisfied may have multiple connotations. It may mean on the right extreme, completely satisfied. On the left side, it may mean slightly dissatisfied as well. Multiple connotations give rise to what is called ambiguity. So latent variables are quite often ambiguous. How do we model? How do we try to model? How do we try to incorporate, in terms of models, impact of ambiguity? Ambiguity is a source of uncertainty, I told you initially. And latent variables, multiple connotations of certain terms and phrases, they give rise to ambiguity. So ambiguity on the one hand, and ignorance about very <coughs> complex systems, because many systems nowadays which are earlier not being investigated. Now they are being investigated through the advent of technological developments. They are highly complex. Their physics is very, very complex. This complexity of the system, along with ambiguity of uh, certain uh, terms and phrases due to multiple connotations of latent feature variables, etc., they give rise to what is called epistemic or systemic uncertainty. Um, Ashok, all these are uh, given in the slides. So if someone is interested, you can pass on the copies to them. Please. So I repeat the different forms of uncertainty. Aleatory, the earliest one. Then model uncertainty, including parametric uncertainty and parametric variation. Experimental uncertainty. Inferential uncertainty due to evidential uncertainty and the black box, and lastly, epistemic or systemic uncertainty. So this is the whole gamut of uncertainty. And uh, coming back to aleatory uncertainty, uh, the way to quantify uncertainty was probability. In fact, uh, there are uh, very well-known philosophers who have said that uh, <clears throat> One of the most important ways to comprehend probability, not to define probability, is to note that probability is a quantification of uncertainty. So by itself, since we are dealing with quantification of uncertainty, the earliest and one of the uh, most established quantification of uncertainty is probability, with various ramifications, possibility, credibility, and so on and so forth. 
with their limitations as well. But the established way, the earliest and the most established way of quantifying uncertainty is probability. And uh, once I use probability, <coughs> there are consequences of uncertainty which also can be quantified. Uncertainty leads to some adverse consequence. So that adverse consequence quantified in some way multiplied by the probability which is quantified uncertainty with which that adverse consequence can happen is typically called risk. Risk is defined as a probability multiplied by the adverse consequence. Uh, this uh, impact or consequence of the adverse consequence rather is sometimes called a loss. So loss multiplied by the probability of incurring that loss is risk. Loss could be the simplest case 0, 1. There could be many other forms of loss. That's not our direct concern. But once we go into risk, we involve probability, we also involve that amount of adverse consequence. The focus on adverse consequence is not much in this particular workshop, but the focus is on quantification of uncertainty or to start with probability. And in terms of risk, as I said at the very beginning of my talk, individuals can be classified into three groups only. Most individuals like myself are called risk averters, who like to avert or avoid risks. There are some people who are called risk neutral, risk neutral. And then there are individuals who are risk prone. They quite accept, quite often accept risks. So risk averters, risk neutral, risk averse, people also say risk averse, risk neutral, and risk prone. Most individuals are risk averse, would like to avoid risks, unless somebody is too adventurous. Adventurous people are definitely not risk averse, they are, uh, they are risk prone. When did you arrive finally? Late last night. I know. Beyond 12? Here, we are well beyond 12. Very well. Uh, <clears throat> so I was talking about this uh, risk aversion, risk neutrality, and risk proneness. And uh, I give you one illustration of a paradox. You take two arms. Each arm can contain only two balls, either black or red. There are two balls in each arm. The first arm of the vessel is known to have one black and one red ball. One black and one red ball. The other also has two balls only. You don't know the composition. The number of black balls has a uniform distribution. The first vessel or the first arm contains one black, one red ball. The second arm uh, contains two balls, no doubt, as the first one. The number of black balls or the number of red balls, the same thing, has a uniform distribution. You, uh, you are allowed to take only one ball from one of these two arms. If that ball turns out to be black, you gain something. Otherwise, you gain nothing or you lose something. And uh, it was noticed that almost every individual goes by the first because it's known. The word known is important. The first arm is known to have one black, one red ball. So probability is half that uh, a black ball will turn up. And with that half, you multiply whatever gain or loss you are having uh, corresponding to a black ball coming up. It's a gain usually. Uh, that's the expected utility. And that's uh, known. Here also, if the number of black balls has a uniform distribution, eventually, this is not known that it contains one black, one red ball. It's simply known that the number of black balls is uniform. Here also, eventually, the probability of getting a black ball, if you calculate it, is half. But it was found in repeated experiments, nobody went in for the second choice. Nobody to, attempted to take a ball out of the second arm. 
because everybody was risk averse. This is a paradox. Although this is half here, half here also, and you expect that some people will go in for taking a ball out of the first turn, others would go in for taking a, horn from the, a ball from the second turn. Everyone was found to take a ball from the first turn because of the word known. It was known to have one black and one red ball. Here you calculate it to be half eventually. Uh, this is a paradox called the Ellsberg paradox. Ellsberg was a US defense analyst and it still goes by the name Ellsberg paradox. It's a paradox really, which corresponds to most decision makers being risk averse. Although youngsters, not like me, are nowadays risk prone. At least they are risk neutral, they are not risk averse. A, uh, a pun, I mean a, a somewhat, uh, I could say, ridiculous extension of risk aversion. You know of the great French mathematician Laplace. Laplace had stated a principle which says equal ignorance leads to equal probabilities. Equal ignorance leads to equal probabilities being assigned. As usual, every scientist, every mathematician will have some contemporary critics. Laplace also had. And among the critics uh, in the community of mathematicians, French mathematicians of Laplace was a gentleman, Ja Burida, B-U-R-I-D-A-N. Burida wanted to criticize Laplace on the count of this particular principle that equal probability leads to equal ignorance. So what he said is this, you imagine an ass, a donkey. So take an ass, a donkey, put it exactly halfway between two stacks of hay. You know hay. Hay is a food for animals. So there is a hay stack there. There is a hay stack here. Uh, hay means some food for the, a fodder for the animal. And the ass of the donkey is uh, made to stand at equal distance from these two. Utility, however you define utility, of taking hay from that stack is the same as utility in taking hay from this stack. And the animal, the ass, is standing exactly halfway between the, these two hay stacks. Then Burida argued that if the animal follows Laplace, it will die of starvation. Because it can't take a decision. This is the equal utility in going to this place, taking hay from this stack. It's the same as negotiating this distance and taking hay from this stack. So the animal cannot decide. If the animal cannot decide, it cannot have fodder or food. It will die of starvation. This is a famous uh, ridiculous example quoted in the history of management science in a classic book by McCloskey and Treften called Buridan's Ass. So this is the consequence of risk aversion in the extreme case somewhat ridiculously stated. But Dempster's Leffert theory is important. That only available evidences have an upper limit to your capability of reaching a decision that will reduce uncertainty. So uncertainty is something which you can never avoid, whether you carry out an experiment or start with the experimental results, process them to extract information or to reach a conclusion, right? Whichever way you are, you cannot avoid uncertainty. You can definitely try to quantify uncertainty, particularly that arising from ignorance, the aleatory uncertainty in terms of probability. If it comes from ambiguity, we can try something like fuzzy set theory. Fuzzy numbers you can make use of. Now, either you have a, a triangular or a trapezoidal or some other form of membership function. That uh, the value that you are quoting is not a single point. It lies in some interval with uh, some membership of being this value, this value, etc., this value over a certain range. So some of you might be dealing with fuzzy set theory and fuzzy logic. 
started by Zade. It was again in the context of ambiguity, virtually. Nothing like ignorance, which was essentially ambiguity that led to the development of fuzzy set theory. There was a later development where two fuzzy sets were used to approximate a crisp theory called the rough set. This is the rough set theory. That way also you try to quantify, either using the classical fuzzy set theory or the rough set theory using a pair of fuzzy sets where you try to approximate a crisp set. Uh, you really can't reduce. You try to incorporate the impact of ambiguity uh, in your analysis. And that way, come up with something which is uh, more acceptable, rather than ignoring this, coming up with something firmly and saying, this is what should be accepted. So this is more scientific, more logical. And uh, there is a third situation where recently, People argue, mathematicians argue, that you are assuming either in the fuzzy set or in the rough set that the value that you are talking of belongs to this set with some membership across the range. Why don't you allow it to be also not lying in the set, a non-membership situation? So recently, a Russian mathematician, I forget the name, he has introduced the concept of intuitionistic fuzzy sets called I fuzzy set. I fuzzy set or intuitionistic fuzzy set has got three possibilities. Namely, it does lie in the set. It does not lie inside the set. It, it lies within the set with different membership or different probabilities in some sense. It may not lie within the set as well. So this possibility of some value that you are trying to represent maybe for a latent variable with multiple connotations, with a uh, fuzzy set or a rough set, maybe that it does not belong to that set also as a possibility. Or that will be in terms of this uh, intuitionistic fuzzy set. If it is uncertainty due to complexity, what do I do? We normally go by approximations. So you have many approximations. And really speaking, most of the systems being complex and we being unable to handle complexity in certain other ways, we try to go by approximations. That way, uh, the more recent uh, developments in the field of optimization theory is in terms of getting approximate solutions only, approximately optimal solutions, not optimal solutions. They can't be called optimal. Most often, optimality eludes us. We won't be able to reach the optimal solution will be happy to get an approximately optimal solution, a nearly optimal solution, a close to the optimal solution, something of that sort. In fact, uh, going back that way, I sometimes recall one of the earliest definitions of operations research or operational research, where the hard code is optimization. This was by a great German philosopher, John Steinhard, <coughs> who argued or who defined Operations research is an art of answering, uh, of, or rather providing bad answers to questions which otherwise would have worse answers. So no question of optimality at all. No question of providing good answers even. The greatest OR scientist, operational research worker, does come up with a bad answer to a question which is so complex that if it doesn't go by that algorithm, that methodology suggested in OR, would have possibly come with a worse answer, right? So it's, a, it's an art, not even a scientific method, as Ashok was trying to explain. It's an art of providing bad answers to questions which otherwise would have worse answers, because the questions are very complex. So essentially, Complexity, ambiguity, and ignorance are the root causes of uncertainty. Uh, the most uh, uh, established way of quantifying uncertainty is probability theory. But there are other attempts going on, rough sets beyond fuzzy sets, intuitionistic fuzzy sets, approximations through algorithms, etc., to quantify and to incorporate 
impacts of uncertainty. Thank you.